Good morning and welcome to our first Thursday of the month, Lunch and Learn. Thank you for being here. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? I don't think I hear it. It's there. Folks, we're going to go ahead and say a prayer, so if you could bow your heads with Jack, he'll read that real quick. Thank you. Father, thank you for this day and for this opportunity to reflect on simply being an American. We meet today just as we do every month to remember and honor those Americans who gave of themselves to preserve the freedoms that we share. And as this great country of ours begins a transitional period of leadership, we ask that you be with those leaders and bless their very important efforts. And Father, please bless this meal and all that we do here. And we ask it all in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Stand with me as we pledge our allegiance to our flag and our country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And Lisa? Lisa's going to lead us in the uh, national anthem. Yes. And I'm usually coming along and not leading it. Oh, say, can you see? By the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched. Were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? You may be seated. We have a quick announcement from Jim Miller with the Newburgh Museum. I will then make an announcement and we will introduce our speaker. Here you go. Thank you, Meredith. Um, my name is Jim Miller and I'm a board member of the, of the Newburgh Museum. On behalf of our museum, we would like to thank the Evansville Wartime Museum for their generosity in lending us some World War II artifacts for display for our World War II theme. We would also like to thank members of the Evansville Wartime Museum for their excellent presentations of certain events of World War II at our speaker series sessions, these members being Bruce Green, Donna Bone, Stephanie and Don Pitchers, Mike Lynn, and Jason Holmes. I'd also like to let you know about an event on November 23rd um, from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. at the Newburgh Museum and we're partnering with the Zion Church which is directly across the street to present the second annual Chris Kendall Market. Over 30 vendors, five food trucks, entertainment for kids and seasonal live music by Old Damn Band, Dulcimers and others and others. <laughs> Parking will be available at the Newburgh Elementary School, handicapped parking next to the vendor's tents at the corner of State and First Street. Um, there's, there's flyers on the tables out, outside uh, where you checked in um, if you want to pick one up. On the back of the flyer is a layout map, and it'll be a lots of fun, and hope to see you there. 
Thank you, Meredith. Thank you guys so much. So um, we've been trying to tell everybody as you've been checking in, I have to update the calendars to hand them out to people. Next Lunch and Learn will be the last one we hold here at the VFW. So November 21st, we'll still be here. In December, we are moving back to the museum. So December 5th, the first one back at the museum, there will be three Lunch and Learns back to back in December, the 5th, 9, uh, 12th, and 19th. So we will update the calendars. They'll be available to pick up again at the table next time in two weeks back here at the VFW and then after that back at the museum starting in December. So we look forward to seeing you guys back uh, at the museum. It's always been our home and we want you guys to come back there with us for the Lunch and Learns. Now on to our speaker, um, Mike Clark, what is a uh, Navy veteran during, who served during the Vietnam War, and uh, he will be here to talk to us about life on the ships and ship warfare during World War II with the, I think the USS Grand Canyon was one of the primary ships on the discussion, so here is Mike Clark. Thank you, Melissa. Meredith. Hold your applause until all have been introduced, please. <laughs> Um, you can't help but have a, a swelling of pride when you are in a group like this and you sing the national anthem. But I'll tell you, I've experienced that one other time to a great extent. And I want to start this, this presentation uh, on, a, on a patriotic note. I'm uh, going to end it on a patriotic note. But if you really want to swell your chest with pride, Get your dress blue uniform on, get on board a Navy warship, and pass the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. I've done that, and I can tell you, it's a it's heart-stopping experience. You just have that rush of patriotism that goes through your bones. And without any further ado, I will uh, endeavor to introduce myself. Um, this is um, a picture of me on the, on the ship. Uh, I was on the USS Grand Canyon. Um, but just to give you a little background on where I come from, um, my name is Mike Clark. Um, I've been called the captain. I've been called Mikey several times. Um, I graduated from Wrights High School 19, in, uh, a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I tore up the books there. I, I graduated 161st out of 357 students. So um, the reason I'm here is because I served in the Navy from 66 to 70. Um, I was a uh, second class personnelman. Um, I'll get into that. Um, my education includes a Bachelor of Science degree from Indiana State University and a Master of Arts degree from Kansas State University, which I managed to do summa cum laude. Uh, I was an instructor at Illinois Benedictine College for a while in Lyle, Illinois. Um, and after I decided to quit there to make enough money to support myself, I uh, ended up at a coal mine in Boonville. Uh, worked there for eight years as a United Mine Worker, and I still have a dues card in my back pocket. Um, and I was uh, fortunate enough to get a job as a claims adjuster for the Indiana Division of Peabody Coal Company after about eight years in the coal mine, and I did uh, that duty for about eight more years traveling around uh, all the coal mines that used to be in the state, um, talking to people, various uh, uh, residents around the mines. And uh, once I got downsized out of that job because the country thought it was uh, bad to burn coal, uh, I managed to, to get on at Kenny Kent Toyota Lexus where I, I found I liked it so well I stayed 30 years. Um, I sold cars for 10 years um, and after 10 they they came and got me and told me that they needed somebody to train salespeople and uh, set up an internet department and do some customer retention programs and stuff like that. So I was, I did that for the next 20 years and uh, retired. So um, that brings me to, uh, to today. And uh, I do come from a military family. Uh, on the left, this is my uncle Bob, Robert, Harry Robert Clark. Uh, in the middle is my dad, Wallace Earl Clark. And on the far right is my uncle, uh, the youngest of the three, uh, William Dudley Clark. 
No, my uncle was on the uh, a ship uh, in the Pacific during World War II. My dad followed uh, in the railroad battalion. He was a company clerk for the railroad battalion that followed Patton through North Africa, Sicily, and Italy. Uh, and uh, on, the, on the far left is my Uncle Bill, who uh, was in the 82nd Airborne, jumped out of a perfectly good airplane before dawn on St. Mary Glees, St. on June 6, 1944, uh, in St. Mary Glees, uh, France. He made, made it back. He got two Purple Hearts in the process, and unfortunately, PTSD took him at 39. Um, again, this is going to be a little bit of a surprise to my wife because she didn't know I had this one picture. <laughs> Who are you there? <laughs> so, there's a little story goes with this, but on the left is my father-in-law, William Edward By. Uh, he was in the uh, Army Air Corps uh, on the, the island of Tinian in the South Pacific. His company was there to uh, support uh, the what ended up being the little boy, the atomic bomb that went into uh, Japan. Um, and he told a lot of stories um, about the white coats, guys running in and out of the fence partitions. The other picture is my, my oldest son um, who served in Desert Storm in the Air Force. Um, and he was a security police. Um, and a quick story, uh, my wife, after he departed to, to go overseas, my wife said, what do you think he's doing over there? And I said, he's the security police. He's wearing his like utility uniform and he's walking around with 45 on his hip. And, you know, they keep those airplanes in concrete bunkers. I said, he's, you know, be okay. <laughs> he came back, we went pick him up down to South Carolina and he's, we got the family over to the house. And we're showing pictures around, all of a sudden, she hollers out across the room, you SOB, you lied to me. And I said, I said, what? And she said, look at this. And it's a, a, a picture somewhat like this, only he's standing out in the middle of the desert in a pile of dirt with a, one of those canopy uh, umbrella things. He's got a, a big gun, bandoleros, no shirt, his khaki pants, and a ball cap. And she said, look what he was doing over there. And I said, you wouldn't have made it all this time without knowing if, if you knew that. And she backed off and she said, yeah, you're probably right. So, but this is a, this is a heritage. Um, and let me digress a second and point out, um, it seems like there might have been a few people in here that waited for people to come back from um, the war or from service. The woman in the middle is my grandmother, um, Leela. Uh, Clark on the, the dark shirt that's my dad Wally my uncle Bob's in the center my uncle Bill's on the right and don't bother with this little guy down at the bottom he just happened to walk through the walk through the room when the picture was being taken but uh, that was me so um, th these this this covers the whole the gamut there were people she had three stars hanging in her front window during World War II so I wanted to pay tribute to all those people who've had that experience so um, now that you know who you're dealing with, uh, if anyone wants to leave, feel free. <laughs> uh, this is a, is a brief overview of uh, one of the most important ships in the United States Navy, the destroyer. Now I was on a destroyer tender, which is, I'll get into that, was a, a repair ship basically, supplies and that sort of thing. That we supported destroyers. Um, and the ship I was on, was the USS Grand Canyon AD-28. The AD designation stands for Auxiliary Ship Destroyer, and it was the 28th hull that was laid down, in other words, the 28th ship of its type of that class. Um, here's another picture of it, and this, this is what it looks like from the harbor in Naples, Italy, where I spent six months. Um, that is probably not the ship I was on, but um, that is a destroyer tender. They're, they set in the behind the seawall, and uh, destroyers come through the, the break in the seawall and tie up alongside, and they can they can receive their services, uh, whether it's one thing or another. Again, that's uh, that coming. But um, several months ago, Dr. Browning asked me where I served in the United States Navy, and my reply was twofold. Uh, I served on the USS Grand Canyon AD-28 for a little over two years, um, and, well, well, wrong button, Mike. 
Okay. Um, trying to get to the red dot. My office was back on right in there on the other side of the ship. Um, and uh, this was at sea, and I was actually on the ship at that time, because it was in 1968. And for over two years, I was assigned to that, that ship, and uh, was home ported in Newport, Rhode Island. I worked in the personnel office handling uh, enlisted service records, um, anything from enlistments to, re uh, to transfers, uh, discharges, and you name it. And since I decided I was going to be in the Navy for at least four years, I wanted to make as much money as I could. So in a year and 10 months, I was a second class personnelman, um, which I've showed you the picture, which is equivalent to a sergeant in the Army. And uh, due to my rank uh, and the, my job title, I was able to go to shore duty after just two years at sea. And the last half of my, uh, oops, I got ahead of myself. The last half of my uh, four years was spent at the Naval Training Center Service School Command in San Diego, California. That's a picture of the entire place, and it's a, a long way from one end of that place to the other. It's now housing development. But um, uh, at that place, we transferred about 500 people every Friday. There was dental schools, radio schools, radar schools, etc. 125 of them came across my desk. I was in charge of what they call port calls, which is overseas transportation. And in that respect, I, somebody was going to the Western Pacific. Uh, their family was usually going home, so there was a lot of arrangements to be made. Not only if, if they were going overseas with them, uh, medical, dental records, uh, all that kind of uh, stuff. And uh, it, was, uh, it, was a, uh, it was a complex job, but it was, it was uh, it needed to be done. And uh, shortly after I got out of the Navy, um, they started building the Vietnam uh, Memorial. And uh, I had an opportunity to be in Washington, D.C. for a couple of weeks on the school. And uh, a relative was living nearby, and they took me on a tour. Uh, and um, I walked through the Vietnam uh, Memorial right after it was uh, built. And we got down through there and I started looking at that black wall and I realized there was names on that wall. And my job in San Diego had sent people over there. So I took a break, went up on the uh, grassy knoll and had a little talk with myself. So um, that pretty much uh, uh, brings, it up, uh, brings us up to date. Uh, but I wanted to, to mention that memorial because if you haven't been there, it's a touching thing. Um, I was going to talk, Dr. Browning asked me if I was to speak on, on the ship I was on, and it's, they're kind of boring, they're repair ships. Um, we had a bunch of machine shops and welders and various different supplies. But I do have some, a couple of uh, stories that will pepper up the talk today. And um, I wanted to uh, show you a picture of how this actually works. The big ship would be the destroyer tender and the ships alongside the destroyers. Now they would come alongside and stay for a long time sometimes. And whatever they needed, um, the ship I was on supplied. Uh, as I said, we had machine shops, we could make, we had a foundry, uh, all kinds of welding, uh, metal fabrication. We had doctors, dentists, um, we had a photo lab. Um, and even a barber shop, <laughs> which I did not like to frequent very much. But um, the, uh, the ship I was on was uh, approximately 500 feet in length. Um, and uh, I think I have another slide there. Yeah. About 500 feet in length, 70 feet wide. The speed was, um, the top speed was 20 miles an hour, but I don't think we ever saw that. Um, uh, the Grand Canyon had 500 enlisted and officers. And the cruising speed on these, these particular ships is about 12 knots. And at that speed, that's about 14 miles an hour. I can tell you this, it takes 12 days to get from Rhode Island to Naples, Italy. <laughs> so, just a, a quick note for your information. Um, a knot is an actually a, is a one nautical mile. It's 1.15 of the land miles. And it is used because it is one degree of latitude. 
So in order to measure where you are on the globe, that's why they use knots. If it's 12 knots, it's 1,200 knots, they can find it in the uh, GPSs anymore. Um, the, uh, we had, the ship I had, ship I was on had a, a drone helicopter. You can see on the back there's a platform. That was where they had drone helicopters. And one, the only armament we had was a gun on the front. And it was, it was never fired um, that, I, that I know of when I was on there, of course. But the, uh, uh, we had anti-submarine rockets, uh, kind of like a torpedo, that in case of emergency, uh, we could drop them. And of course, we never did, never did have to do that. But uh, <clears throat> these ships were kind of like the backbone of long distance deployments. And um, they were functional, but not exciting. And as I said, I could spend the rest of the afternoon talking about them, but uh, it, it's uh, much more interesting to talk about something that had a lot of dynamics in the in the Pacific Theater and Atlantic. But my talk is, you know, is uh, to the Pacific end of things. Um, and and uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, shipboard life to get started. Um, during when you're tied up in your home port, it's just like anything else. Uh, you go to work, you eat lunch, you get off of work, and you're free usually for the rest of the day. Uh, I had a pretty decent job. I had to be at the office at uh, 7.30 in the morning for what they called muster to get lined out on what was going on for the day. And we started work at 8, got off at 11.30 for lunch, started back at 1, got off at 4. So that was pretty nice, uh, pretty nice duty. And... Uh, at sea, it's really the same routine, with the exception of the fact you don't have the option to go ashore. <laughs> so you're pretty much confined to what, what you have there. And um, uh, also there's no alcohol and no fast food available to you. In a foreign port, it's just about the same as it is when you're in your home port in the United States, uh, except you're hungover every day. <laughs> so I'm sure some people will be able to relate to that. Um, as far as the cruises that, that I took part in, I uh, went to the shipyards in Brooklyn, New York for three months in the summer, which was not a nice thing to do. Uh, once we got out of there, we went to Cuba for a few weeks on a, what they call a shakedown cruise, where they test all the stuff and see if it, they put it back together right. Um, and uh, we had a weekend in Puerto Rico where I narrowly escaped a thumping by a couple of locals. Uh, that's another story. Um, well, shortly after that, we deployed the day after Thanksgiving uh, and um, went to Naples. And they say it takes two weeks to get over, two weeks to get back. We were there for five and a half months uh, during Christmas, of all things. And let me digress one more time. In New Year's, I just thought about this the other day. New Year's 1967, I was in Times Square in New York City for the ball drop. One year ago, a later, New Year's Day, 1968, I'm in Vatican Square on New Year's Day for the papal uh, New Year's blessing. And that was really exciting. It was packed. Um, and uh, uh, oddly enough, my dad had been there during the war, uh, also in Rome. They were in Rome for a long time. And um, he was one of uh, about 12 or 24 uh, U.S. Army servicemen who got a private audience with the Pope. And I have the certificate and the picture in my, in my uh, house hanging proudly um, because not everybody gets to, gets to do that. <clears throat> got back to Newport and sat in there for a few months and then they decided we needed to go to Scotland, Holland, and the North Sea. And uh, it was really interesting. Um, and I can tell you this, that if the Titanic had been in the water that we were in in the North, North Atlantic that night, nobody would have survived because it was the roughest I ever had experienced. It was uh, pretty nasty weather. We got into Holland um, and it was very, very interesting because where I'm standing, let's say right now, let's say I'm looking down off the ship and there was water in the canal and it was about this far up and it was just land as far as you could see, flat. Because actually Amsterdam, where we went, 
it, most of Holland, I think, is uh, or Netherlands is under under below sea level, and we go through locks, and you're in lower lower level water level. But it was very interesting because most of the time, when you're close to land, there's it's like this, but it was just flat, straight on out, nice and green, um, and it was it was really. Uh, it was enjoyable to see. It was tranquil. Um, but anyway, um, we were coming back from that cruise, and uh, there was three, chip, three ships together, two repair ships, myself, my, my ship, and another one, and we had a fleet tug with us. And we were going along, and they transferred people from one ship to the other on what they call a high line. And they will shoot a rope across to the other ship. You go in like this through the, through the sea, they shoot a line across there and they string some more ropes and then they put what they call a bosun's chair, which is like a, a park swing. <laughs> and the guy sits in that, he gets strapped in with a life jacket and with terror in his eyes, they crank him from one ship to the other through, through um, probably from here to this, the back wall. And you know, that's a terrifying experience, it had to be. I saw the guys and I said, I'm glad I'm not going over there. But anyway, um, that was that was kind of a uh, interesting, interesting, uh, interesting day. But I want to talk about a little bit more interesting subject. I'm going to talk about the destroyer, uh, especially in the southern uh, South Pacific uh, during World War II. They made a lot of difference there. Um, the destroyer is a, a warlike title for a ship, and truly, it was uh, quite a menace to the enemy. Um, and the, the wartime destroyers led a pack of ships, and this is one of the one of the ships that was active in that uh, uh, area. It's the USS Fletcher, and it was the first ship of its design, and therefore it was the, every ship after that with the same design was called the Fletcher class, and they were uh, different names. This is what a, uh, a battleship squadron would have looked like. Uh, <clears throat> the battleship would be in front. There's probably, not in this picture, but probably destroyers out in front, submarines around where you can't see them. Behind that is, uh, I would say, a cruiser and probably a tender and an oiler uh, to take care of uh, the long-distance deployments. They had to have ships full of oil to fuel the other ones. So that's what uh, that particularly looks like. Um, the uh, battleships uh, were, uh, at one point, had been the, the focal point of armament for uh, uh, naval warfare. Um, they were uh, about uh, six, 900 feet long, 120 feet wide, and uh, about 50,000 tons. Um, as I said, they were the, at one time before the war, and just at the beginning of World War II, they were the, the pivotal weapon that the Navy would send out with other ships around it, um, submarines, and et cetera. But the Japanese figured out that a better weapon to put in the middle of all the ships was an aircraft carrier, because you can do a whole lot more damage with 80 airplanes than you can uh, a dozen guns. These are 16-inch guns. <clears throat> and those are the projectiles, armor-piercing projectiles. Uh, between the projectile and the powder charts, they were six feet long, and they weighed 2,700 pounds. And to just give you an idea, the barrels on these guns were 66 feet long, and the 16 inches is about like this. That's how big those projectiles are. And they, 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 they could fire them it would be the equivalent of shooting a Toyota Corolla from Boonville to Mount Vernon in about 90 seconds. So that's the kind of punch those things had. And there were other guns on the ships uh, as well, uh, shorter range guns. But um, I thought that was kind of an interesting statistics. Of course, I made up the part about the Toyota Corolla. <laughs> um, and, uh, they could shoot those things 24 miles. Uh, that was the last statistic. Um, these, um, these shells, as I said, were 16 inches in diameter, and uh, the uh, carrier took the place of the battleship because of, uh, obviously, you can see the armament that's on that carrier. 
Uh, they normally carried about 80 aircraft. There were torpedo bombers, fighters, and um, dive bombers. And they had, each had a squadron, and uh, uh, they, they would, uh, all the airplanes on that ship are not on the deck. Um, but during World War II, uh, the carrier group, uh, which looked something like this, uh, again, that's a, a small picture of what would actually have been happening, but uh, it, it took the same place as, as, let's say, a battleship. Instead of a battleship, it was a carrier. Um, and the destroyers were set up around these, these uh, larger vessels to um, fend off um, torpedoes, aircraft, um, anything that would be aiming at the main weapon, which would be either the battleship or the carrier. And um, again, this is uh, the destroyer that did all the work um, up until the fight got real heavy. Uh, they were nimble, small targets, and they had a lot of firepower at close range. And the, this is a typical World War II destroyer, 380 feet long, a little bit longer than a football field, 40 feet wide. They had a speed, a top speed of 42 miles an hour, which made them very uh, maneuverable. They carried five uh, five-inch guns, four, four 40 millimeter guns in twin mounts, and they had eight 20 millimeter guns in single mounts. And another uh, factor that they had, two more of the factors, they had torpedoes that they could, they could throw in the water, and they also had depth charges. And the depth charges could be set at different depths when they were searching for submarines, and you've probably seen movies. But um, they could also throw the depth charge away from the ship to get a further, further uh, coverage. And an interesting thing I found out was if a ship is going down and they know they're going to abandon ship, there are people scurrying around, disarming the depth charges. I said, okay. The reason for that is if the ship is going down in the water, those depth charges are set to go off at a certain depth. They would then explode, which would be an intense uh, situation if there were men in the water nearby or still men trapped in the, in the, in the ship. Um, the guns on the destroyers had a range of fire of about uh, six miles for surface targets, which is a long way. Let's think about that. And then they could shoot aircraft down about 10 miles out. Um, they ran about uh, 30, uh, three, uh, about 300 enlisted men and 50 officers. And to, to break this down a little bit better for you, I put this together. Um, it give you some idea of the when you see a picture of a Navy officer, um, you're going to you're going to find that uh, they have various uh, stripes on their uh, arms and the shoulder boards. But the ones we're going to be talking about were the lieutenant commanders and the commanders for the most part, uh, they were in charge of the, the destroyers. Um, they did not normally would there be a captain uh, on board, but if, if the commander was, or lieutenant commander was in charge of the ship, he was the captain. He was the guy that said what we're gonna do, regardless of his rank. Could have been a Benenson. Actually, the Liberty boats we went off of the ship to the, to the shore in, would be operated by a second-class petty officer right there, and they were the captain of that vessel. So uh, this is one of the reasons I brought this up, because um, these are non-commissioned officers here, um, and of course you get up here, the fleet admiral is only seen during wartime, but um, um, there, was a, there were at least one or two in, during World War II. But um, these are the, the uh, uh, ranks, so you, you get some idea of what, uh, what, uh, what the situation is. Now, um, this is, we're getting into a little bit about a short shipboard life. That's, that's where you lived. Um, and I was, I was going through this the other day and I thought that guy's got a pen in his hand. It could just as well have been a cigarette, a cigar, or a pipe. Even in the close quarters, once it was once it was um, time that you could smoke in the birthing compartments, they rang a bell and said it's the smoking lamp is lit in birthing areas, so you could stand there and smoke a cigarette while you got dressed. And you can see how tight that is, and uh, that's really how tight it was. I slept on the bottom rack for over two years. 
um, and there were four people in the stack above me. <laughs> so if you were trying to get some sleep and somebody stepped on the side of your bunk or your rack, there's just an aluminum tube, and it would, it would kind of do that. And so get to bed, you know. But um, <laughs> the reason I said it was, it was, uh, it was um, how do you say, uh, it, 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 it was a, a, there was a, a reason that I, did, I slipped on the bottom because I didn't have to make it up every morning. Because <laughs> there was a, aluminum straps that held those things in place. When I got rolled out of my rack, first off, I was on the floor. And secondly, I could grab one of those aluminum straps, pull the rack up, hook it on there, and they could sweep uh, the floor underneath there. Everybody else had to make their bed up. But well, rank has its privileges, I guess you might say. But um, in the, when you're in the middle of the ocean, none of that stuff really matters. Um, but this is one of the things that demonstrates how close people work together, how closely they work together. And um, when you're standing on top of the ship and the order that you last heard was abandoned ship, you look around and you say, I hope you guys can do your duty because we're going to be in that little black boat for a long time, probably. But the, the truth of the matter is you don't have to question that because you all were trained the same way and you know what to do in these kind of situations. And again, um, that bond lasts forever. I'm sure everybody that's wearing one of these hats understands that. As I worked with um, a guy that was on the ship with me in uh, Kinnikin Toyota, and uh, he probably sold some of you a car. Um, but um, he came to me one day when they were having a lot of these shooting incidents at businesses. And uh, he said, Mike, he said, what, what, what do you think we ought to do if that happens? And I said, I don't know, Ron, but I'm going to be looking for you. And he said, you know, I'm going to be looking for you. <laughs> so that bond never leaves. I, I get a message almost every day from a guy that lives in Connecticut that we were on the ship together. We worked in the office together. I've been to see him many, many times. He's been uh, in the Midwest to see us uh, before. But um, it's, it's um, something that it's hard to explain, but um, I'm sure you, you fellows understand. Um, this is um, a slide of part of the Pacific Ocean, which uh, is where a lot of this, most of this stuff that I'm going to talk about took to, to place. Um, and I'm going to talk about the, the Pacific Theater and the destroyer's role in the war. There was action in two oceans, but the Atlantic was not the ship-to-ship -ship situation that it was in the Pacific. The battle in the arena in the uh, Atlantic Ocean was from the East Coast to uh, Europe, uh, France, England, and uh, also North Africa. But in the Pacific, it was a wide, wide place. It was about twice as big a theater as the Atlantic. Um, and the Atlantic had, had more civilian traffic uh, because of the uh, liners going back and forth uh, from Europe to uh, uh, the United States. <clears throat> so um, there's an item a little bit closer to home. This is a, a picture of uh, <clears throat> the cruiser Indianapolis. Uh, they were named after um, major cities in the United States. Um, Toward the end of the war, uh, which was brought on by the dropping of the atomic bomb, um, the Indianapolis was on a secret mission to carry uranium and other uh, components for the little boy atomic bomb to Tinian Island. Uh, they were running back from delivering their, their payload, and they were torpedoed, and they were running silent, uh, dark at night, but a submarine found them and torpedoed them, and the ship sank in a few minutes. There's a, a big piece of machinery there. There was 1,195 men on board. 300 went down with the ship. The remainder faced starvation, exposure, and sharks. Uh, the top secret mission uh, disallowed them from locating their position. So it took four days for anybody to recognize that that ship was missing. 
During that period of time, you can imagine guys were even in the water, which was a lot of them in the water, some of them in light rafts, life rafts, some of them holding on to something that floated. Only 316 survived that ordeal. And the Indianapolis is the greatest single, sh single loss of life in one ship in the entire history of the United States Navy. And some of you probably saw the movie Draw Jaws. That brought up the Indianapolis again. And that was actually the first time I ever heard about it. The guy that played one of the, the guys that was out to, to kill all the sharks he could, he had a tattoo about the Indianapolis on his arm. So um, I thought that was interesting because it was close to home. Um, one of the most important items of service for any ships is, is to rescue downed airmen and sailors. And it is amazing. I've also read a book about uh, these particular guys. Uh, this airplane was designed specifically to land and take off in the water. And it was low enough in the water that people could come out of a life raft right into the, right into the airplane. I don't remember how many people that would hold, but these guys were on patrol constantly during the war, day and night, uh, looking for downed airmen and downed sailors, uh, and they rescued thousands. I, I've got another statistic here in a minute we'll, I'll share with you. But I thought this was interesting. Uh, there was a book I read called um, Legend of the Black Cats, and it was written by a guy whose dad was a pilot in one of the Black Cats, and he kept a diary. And the, the guy found it after his dad had passed away, pieced it together and wrote this book. It's a fascinating book. Um, but at any rate, uh, to put this, all this into, uh, into perspective, in other words, what, when, and where, I want to describe the exploits of the most highly decorated squadron in the Pacific Theater during World War II. That was led by the USS O'Bannon, USS Nicholas, and USS Taylor. Uh, later on, I'll get back to these three ships, so remember those names. Um, one of the most important battles of the war was the Guadal Guadalcanal. Now, that was not a canal. It's an island. I thought it was a canal, too. <laughs> but um, this is where it is. The red is the Guadalcanal. Up in the top, you can see <coughs> excuse me, a square <coughs> next to Australia. <coughs> so you can see um, where, where it is. And backing up, uh, well, I won't back up that far. Um, you can see that <clears throat> in that circle is the Guadalcanal. And these destroyers and the squadrons and, and the whole war went along the top of New Guinea on up through the Philippines and up to Japan. <clears throat> Solomon Islands, the Gilbert Islands, Marshall Islands, New Guinea, Philippines, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and finally Japan. Uh, they appeared, those three destroyers and their squadron, 21, appeared in almost every major assault from 1942 to 1945. They won more commendations than any other squadron. Statistically, they helped sink or sunk 10 submarines, dozens of surface vessels, shot down scores of aircraft, and rescued 1,800 sailors and airmen. Their jobs during all this was to fight in big battles, fight in small battles, escort battleships and carriers, and search for submarines and kamikazes. This campaign involves several ships, including the cruiser Juno. This is another interesting side note. I did find this out while I was on the ship in Newport. Um, on board the cruiser Juno were five brothers from the Sullivan family from Waterloo, Iowa. They all went down with the ship. Later on, after the war, the Navy commissioned another destroyer named the USS The Sullivans, DD-537. And I'd know for a fact, because I was in the personnel office, people would request to have their brother come on the ship, or I guess their dad maybe, or their son. And we put in a request to be denied. But they just, this policy was still in place. I don't know if it is today. I think it's a pretty good idea, though. <clears throat> so, um, the 
Guadalcanal victory was uh, like a pivotal situation because, according to Admiral Halsey, who was who was in charge of the Pacific uh, uh, fleet, it was a, it was a slim victory but a great turning point because it controlled the East advance or the West advance. Hawaii and the United States were to the West, so they wanted to control that. The Japanese had a army base on Guadalcanal, and it took a while for the Marines and the, everybody to get get those people off of there, and they had a big battle uh, on, in front of the island. But just to give you some idea of what it took to get all that stuff done, um, those destroyers were, most of them were in motion, some or all of the time. During the uh, evening, they left at sunset. They took off from their, wherever they reported. They did night raids on shore, and ba shore and ba emplacements. They were in sea battles. They returned after dawn to their port. And during the daylight hours, they replenished what they had spent overnight. And the trick of that is that the sailors got very few hours of sleep, and usually not much in one, at one time, because they were busy replenishing the supplies that they had thrown overboard the night before. So um, <laughs> another statistic that's kind of interesting, in a, a ship of that nature, in that climate, um, it, the book I read on, on this particular uh, uh, destroyer squadron said that uh, the, the inside temperature in one of those ships is about 120 degrees during the day. And I know for a fact there was no air conditioning on my ship. But we were in Cuba, it was a little warm, but uh, anywhere else it wasn't too bad. But um, they would drag the, their four inch mattress up on deck to sleep on deck during the period of time that they could. But the sweat running off their bodies usually kept them awake. So it was, it was kind of tough. Um, once they departed their, excuse me, their home, their port where they were uh, um, tied up, once they got out into sea, they were usually called to general quarters, which means everybody is at their battle station. If you run a gun, you were sitting at the gun. If you handle torpedoes, you were at the torpedoes. And one of the things that was so exhausting to these people was that they were at that high state of readiness in constant fear of danger, literally for 24 24 hours. 12 of that might have been where they were loading and unloading supplies, but still and yet it takes its toll. And <clears throat> these different destroyers would be in, in, uh, in their port, where, whichever island they were at, and they would all get together and, and at the, the places where they could have some, some drinks and play cards and whatever. And they developed a good um, camaraderie between the ships and the squadron. And they, they, they really built a a cohesive uh, fighting force there, and um, so it gave, if, if a ship was down, their first priority was to go f find the guys in the water. And so everybody stuck together out there, and they made their friendships on the, uh, in two places, one at the, uh, what we used to call the Gidunk, and the other one was at sea. And this, um, the captain, uh, McDonald, who was the captain of the old Bannon, who was lieutenant commander, he sensed uh, the emerging confidence among his men, and they had an attitude that he said combined experience with hatred of the enemy, and he said the trans transformation occurred, accrued during the awful nights of bombing, exchanging fire with the enemy ships, the constant strain and vigilance had kept them, they kept and endured. The boys that boarded the ship in Bath, Maine at the shipyard became um, a uh, hardened, a battle-hardened group of men. And as an aside, I was told after I got out of the uh, basic training, I guess, or maybe even out of the Navy entirely, my dad told me that when I went to, to boot camp, he told my mother, he said, there goes your little boy, they'll send you back a man. I guess they did. The surrender uh, was taking place uh, in Tokyo Bay on uh, September 2nd, 1945. They, uh, one of the problems with the Japanese, they were not going to surrender unconditionally, but they finally did. The ceremony on the deck of the battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay. Now, lead, you remember those three ships I mentioned first. 
Admiral Halsey was a destroyer man. He came out of destroyers and ended up being commander of the Pacific Fleet. But he was so proud of the destroyer and what they could do for the war effort that he had those three ships lead the battleship Missouri into Tokyo Bay for their surrender. Now that was quite an honor. These guys did their duty and they got that reward for it. This is the modern Navy. This is a destroyer, a guided missile destroyer, Arleigh Burke. Um, that's in comparison to the ships you've seen um, up to this point. And uh, there's uh, about there. There's a nuclear version of this, and then um, a, uh, a a destroyer. And that's about the only three designations that are left in the in the Navy today. Well, history tells us the U.S. was victorious in both theaters of war. Sure, we had good equipment, strong support at home, and a massive output by factories and shipyards. But without the dedicated men and women of the military and the civilian workers, it would have turned out differently. I'm going to try to get through this. We had a quote here from um, Sergeant John Ellery in the 16th Regiment, D-Day. I wish I'd have put this on the screen. He said, you can buy, you can manufacture weapons, you can purchase ammunition, but you can't buy valor, and you can't pull heroes off an assembly line. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes there's questions and answers. I don't have any answers. If you have a question, I'd be happy to entertain that. Uh, my dad served, uh, can you hear it right? My dad served on a destroyer escort in the Aleutians in World War II. Unfortunately, he never really spoke about much about it, and I didn't ask him about it. What is the difference between a destroyer and a destroyer escort in terms of their mission? Destroyer uh, escort versus a destroyer? Yeah, it's a smaller ship, uh, less people, less capabilities, uh, but it's, uh, again, they're, they did away with those back at the same time they did away with the destroyer tenders. Um, it, the, they could get into places a shallower draft, uh, get into places that uh, closer to various different things. And uh, we had in Newport there were several DEs and, and obviously DDs, but that that was primary primarily they were just a smaller ship, uh, more maneuverable, and they still had firepower and they could get into places that the the larger ships couldn't. 
But basically, they had the same mission. Yeah, yeah. very and much so. Same mission, different settings. Yep, exactly. The cruisers, and they had the same mission. Um, and uh, the ship I was on was a support ship. Um, so again, uh, we could fix just about anything. The ship that broke down in the middle of the ocean, uh, I didn't finish that story, but that ship we were with, all of a sudden I'm standing out there on deck watching and the big black ball of smoke rolls up out of their stack. And what in the world is that? They cut all the lines and everything went silent. We went, stopped, we shut down, went, uh, we had no power going. And we drifted a long way. And uh, all of a sudden, the, uh, the, the Commodore on the other ship released us to go back to Newport. We got back about three days earlier over what we were supposed to be. So it wasn't, uh, it didn't bother us that bad, but we thought we would have to stick around and help them. But they were able to repair their own ship. So the reason they don't have those, those ships anymore is because of the, the uh, the difference in the propulsion now, the difference in the, the equipment, uh, these people can get back and forth a lot quicker. There's a lot more places for them to go and get fixed in a shipyard or a civilian place. So, um, anybody else? They always said if you did a, a good job, they use usually either a lot of questions or no questions. So, <laughs> I'm somewhere in between. Thanks for your speech. Uh, how much oil did you guys cover, uh, have in your belly? How much what? Oil, fuel for the other ships. We didn't really carry fuel except for oh, yeah. our own ship. That was the okay. oilers. All right. They, they uh, um, were with every one of those uh, squadrons and convoys that you've seen because they had to supply. There was no, no place out there. Um, and I don't know how much oil they carried, but um, evidently it was a lot. So they would fill up a ship and keep them back going. All set then? Any other questions? What was the name of the book, The Black Cats? The Black Cats? It was the book. It was either The Legend of the Black Cats or The Secrets of the Black Cats. Uh, I don't remember the author, but it's a fascinating book. Moreover, because of the guy that, that wrote the book was the son of the guy who kept the diary and was the pilot. And um, they did a, you can imagine getting out in, a, in that kind of an airplane and flying out at, they were all painted black, that's why they were called black cats. Um, they did so much of their work at night, um, but they didn't have any guns. They were just out there trying to find people to save their lives. And that was, that was their job. Any more questions? Uh, I see towards the end there, you had a picture of the surrender there in Japan there. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, I see there, towards the end, you had a picture of the surrender, sign the surrender in Tokyo Bay. Uh -huh. And I used to watch a show by Oliver North, War Stories, and he interviewed people, and he interviewed Tony Curtis, and he was supposedly, what I can remember, it was sitting in a crow's nest of the ship right next to it. So he got to witness the whole ceremony. That was a big deal. Yeah. Big deal. So, uh, I never was in the Navy. I was in the Air Force, but I got a friend of mine out in Armstead. Uh, he was in the Navy for four years in a supply ship. And uh, one year they happened to be in New York Harbor during Fleet Week. And uh, these are stories he, we talked about. And during Fleet Week, and they wanted some people to go down to the Ed Sullivan show uh, the, in uniform, mm -hmm. set them in the, all, or, uh, the, mm -hmm. or, the audience. And uh, he, uh, he, he thought, well, he ain't got no money, so might as well do this. And so he went, anyway, he got to see the first performance of Elvis Presley. 
Oh, well. <laughs> so I guess those are things I learned just getting acquainted with people that, like I said, since we retired, we sit out there and just tell war stories of our own and stuff. Yeah. I would like to thank everyone for, for coming today. Um, it's an honor to stand here and speak to you folks about the U.S. military. And uh, I proudly wear my hat almost everywhere I go. Um, and uh, whenever, I see, whenever I see somebody else that's got one of these hats, it's usually going to be a little bit of a conversation, and my wife has to come find me. <laughs> so thanks again.